Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jason Haas. Uh, welcome to my weekly Wednesday live broadcast from Tablas Creek. Um, I will be inviting a real icon on to, to talk today. Um, it's going to be Madeline Trafon, who is the beverage director at Plum Market um, and was the first woman to earn the, the Master Sommelier title in America back in 1987. She's inspired a whole generation of, of sommeliers since then. So um, she is amazing. I'll be inviting her to join in like three or four minutes. But first, I want to take you on my normal um, little visual tour of what's going on at the winery right now. So. Um, the big thing for us is that we have started harvesting. So here's our harvest chalkboard. You can see um, it is mostly empty still. We have two Viognier lots listed on it. Um, we have a, a Viognier lot that came in on Monday um, from the Derby Vineyard. And then we have our own first estate lot that came in with a night harvest last night. Um, so it's the very beginning, but it's important to remember that um, most of the vineyard is still just really going through verasion. So I thought it would be fun to go in and give you a little sense of what everything looks like right now. So we're going to go grape by grape. Um, I'm going to start with Morvedra. So you can see it is um, mostly turned color. It's mostly through verasion. Um, still very plump. We've, uh, we've got a lot of ripening still to go. We're probably six weeks away from that. Here's Kunwaz, which is the last to go through Verasion. You can see there's still a decent number of green berries. Uh, that's also probably six weeks out. Syrah, on the other hand, is getting really close. Um, this was super tasty. Um, the seeds were starting to turn brown, and we're figuring that we'll be picking this Syrah within a couple of weeks. Um, it's, it looks good. And then finally, Grenache, um, which I love this picture just because it shows you the kind of jewel tones that Grenache has. Um, but uh, it's also still probably at least a month out. Um, a couple other things that's going on. It's not just the grapes that are getting ripe. Um, the fruit trees that we have interplanted in the vineyard as part of our biodynamic program. That's a, a quince that you see up there on the right. Um, that's looking good. Our staff garden is looking great. We have a giant um, bowl basket of tomatoes in the cellar that everyone is helping themselves to. We have corn that's ready, tomatillos, lots of stuff. Um, show you a few other grape varieties that I don't normally don't normally take you through because they're a little rarer and a little newer for us. Um, first, uh, check out Senso. Um, we got our first Senso harvest last year. You can see the giant grapes. Um, they're almost like table grape size. This is eh, getting fairly ripe. We're probably something like three weeks away from this. Um, and then finally, Terre Noir, um, which is maybe a month out. Um, it looks darker than it actually is. You can see on the bottom of this cluster a little bit where the light's shining through from the back. It's still kind of pinkish. It never gets all that dark. Um, and just because it seems like it would be a shame not to show you anything that's white, um, here's a Grenache Blanc cluster. Um, it, showing you a whole bunch of different white grapes isn't particularly instructive because it's, um, and they all look roughly the same unless you can get up close and personal to them. Um, the big news for us in the last couple of weeks has been our weather. Um, we've had some days that were so smoky that we couldn't open. Um, so I have a couple pictures here. I have to scroll back a little bit because thankfully it was a few. It was, it was last week. But um, just to, to show you what it looked like, um, this is a picture over at the coast. Um, the picture at the, at the vineyard is even a little further back. Um, we were escaping to the coast where we could because it was so smoky here. Um, sorry, okay, here's a couple of pictures from the vineyard. So um, you can see, you can barely see the hills to the west. Um, it was it was pretty horrible. We had to close for three days because of smoke. It was just unsafe to be out here. But thankfully, the skies have cleared. I have that same picture from today um, up at the top of the vineyard. Um, and you'll see it looks so much better. Uh, here we go. So same perspective, one week apart. Okay, um, that's enough of the pictures. Let me invite uh, Madeline to join. Um, so there we go. Um, so waiting for Madeline, she's joining on the Plum Market um, Instagram account. Hello, Madeline. Hi. 
thank you so much for for joining me um, oh no i'm thrilled to be with you i'm only sorry i'm not in a beautifully natural environment the way you are and but it was so nice to get the tour of the vineyards though very sobering to see all the smoke oh yeah it was it was the worst that i've ever seen in my 18 years out here last week no, um, kidding. and we're grateful that I mean, the, the, the weather shifted. We started getting onshore winds um, on Sunday. It cleared everything up, and we've had really good conditions since then. But I wrote a blog this week basically making the case that anybody who's visiting wine country should treat it like a trip to the beach for the rest of this year. That, yeah, you make your plans, but check conditions that morning because there are between fires and heat and smoke and rain, um, there are lots of things that could impact a visit. With COVID lurking beneath it all, and I mean... All y'all are heroes out there. I'm telling you, I live in the relatively calm uh, Midwest, a.k.a. Michigan. We've got the Great Lakes going for us. And truly, I can't complain about a damn thing. But I'm glad my heart is with you at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yeah. This, these last couple of days have been eye opening for all of us. And of course, it is COVID, which is behind all of these challenges, because we, along with all of the other wineries, are only able to do outdoor tastings. We can't welcome anyone inside. So we're subject to the conditions in a way that we never, never would have been before. It's truly extraordinary, uncharted times by anybody's measure, you know, for everyone, though, you know, my my uh, my previous clan, the restaurant business, has gotten hit so hard. You yeah. know, I'm trying to keep in touch with everyone as much as possible because I work for an upscale retailer now. Though, you know, I I uh, touch consumers a lot. That's where my real my heart lies there before it lies with wine. That's the truth. You know, if I if I didn't have wine, I'd use something else to talk to them about. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Uh, well, so let's start back in the back in the beginning. How did, did when you did you grow up around wine? Was wine on your table as a as 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 a kid and a young adult? Yes, but there's a massive caveat. I was born in New London, Connecticut, but I moved over to Athens, Greece when I was three. My mother remarried a Greek naval officer. So I grew up in the outskirts of Athens and didn't come back to the States until I was 18 to go to U of M. And we had wine, but it wasn't like, you know, interesting, cool Greek wine the way it is today. No acidic or from Santorini, you know. Uh, it was, you know, we drank wine with regularity. It was, you know, you had your choice of white, red, or rosé. It was not forbidden for young people to right. sip on it a little bit. Um, I never drank to the point of feeling it at all until I came to the States because I think it wasn't a forbidden fruit, you know, and it was always around. But no, I... Uh, I tripped into the wine business. I was going to um, either go to med school, but I was studying theater, which is definitely right brain, left brain battle going <laughs> on there, right? And I was offered the position of a sommelier when the Renaissance Center was being built in Detroit. And they asked me, uh, the food and beverage director asked me to speak, uh, a, no, to read a French menu. And I sounded really good. I've got a great <laughs> accent. Oh, I can't move out of present tense. Forget it. And he said, do you want to be a sommelier? And I said, sure. What's that? <laughs> I was 21. And here I am. It worked out. That's amazing. It was very clearly it was meant to be. I love the I love that this is your theater background coming, uh, coming into play and opening a door in the world of wine. No, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, I think about that with regularity. The thing about theater, live theater, is there's a danger to it that I just love. And restaurants have that. You plan your brains out. You let it go. And, you know, you don't know what's going to happen from moment to moment or table to table or day to day, you know. And I just loved that. I love the thrill of it. So I was actually, I hung on to work in the floor until 10 years ago. And it wasn't, you know, I just liked it. I love that interaction and that danger. I've always said that uh, people should work in restaurants just to, just to graduate into adulthood. Like there's so many <laughs> things that you learn, uh, like learn to think on your feet, learn to multitask, learn to uh, how to deal with people who are upset, learn to calm, to defuse situations. There's all these things that happen in a restaurant world that are just critical life skills. No, you know, well said. It either makes you blow up or it really changes you in a good way. I mean, there have been studies. Uh, some time ago, I read something that said that, you know, people who work the floor of restaurants um, are able to handle stress second only to air traffic controllers, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was glory. I and mean, you either love it or it just 
makes you crazy, you know? Right. And like you and and you really, you know, you, you really get to understand the difference between confidence and arrogance because arrogance, you know, you know th there's only one person who's right and it's not me. Yeah. Uh, so do I need to do something? I'm going a little, oh, there we go. Yeah. This, this is my first Instagram live. So I'm you're glad doing I'm doing it with a you're, friend. <laughs> you're doing great. Uh, cool. So uh, how long before, how long after you started in restaurants as your, your job as a, your, the first sommelier job where you had to have ex explained to you what a sommelier was, yes. <laughs> um, how, how long from there did it take you to really get serious about it and decide that you wanted to study, decide you wanted to pursue the, the master sommelier certification? I was really thrust into it. They, you know, a couple of years into the whole thing, this 1400 room hotel, they made me the buyer because they, you know, because there were no corporate wine programs in those days. They told me, hi, here's the list of distributors. Here's the, how you figure a cost of goods. Don't spend more than that amount of money. That was my training. I kid you not. And um, I was entered into a couple of competitions, French sommelier competitions by an ambitious beverage director. It wasn't me who wanted to do it. And I did okay nationally, much to my shock. You know, I just educated myself. This is pre-internet, right? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're memorizing Hugh Johnson's World Atlas. <laughs> and then that's it. We've got fax machines. And then I was, in, I was invited to take the MS exam the first year they had it in the States in 1987 because there was no process. You know, there were 20 of us that uh, that sat the advanced course and the five of us who passed took the MS exam the next day. So I didn't go after this. I just didn't say, say no to a challenge. That's the God's honest truth. And I taught myself to blind taste in a short period of time. And to this day, I sure don't like doing it, but I am uh, fierce about mentoring other people to get through it, you know. So, no, it just, it truly was me. I don't say no to challenges. That's the only credit I get. <laughs> that's uh, it. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Um, and it really, I mean, you were the, you were the, what, the ninth American to be a master? I, I think the, I was the, the first sixth. Woman? I was the sixth. The I sixth. was after cool. uh, Fred Dame and Ron Wiegand and a few other people. And in rapid succession, Evan Goldstein, Nuncio, Nuncio Alioto, Larry Stone passed. So I was the sixth American. The first American woman, which was still the case for about 10 years for no sensible reason. There was no, you know, we weren't, there wasn't a barrier. And, you know, to quote Evan, it was just a simpler, more aspirational time. You know, the process going through it in the exam really hasn't changed that much. It's just that now there are like over 150 of us in the States and right. we were in the single digits <laughs> back then. But, you know, wine taught me and the customers taught me. Those were my greatest source and they've never betrayed me. The wine has never betrayed me. I really still get tears in my eyes when I think about it, because when I'm tasting wine, man, there's part of me that's utterly silent listening to it. Because, you know, it deserves it, right? Uh, all y'all put a lot of effort <laughs> in it. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, no, I truly, uh, I truly, I love tasting wine because I don't do it intellectually. I apply my mind afterwards, but there's a period of time like looking at art or listening to music where it's just whatever language the wine is using, that's what I'm using. I love that description of like the silence that you mm -hmm. that you feel when you're really trying to to absorb everything that an experience is is offering you. And and, and I I love that you compare both art and wine tasting because I feel like it's the same thing. A lot of cases, what you want to do is empty your mind just so that you can absorb whatever it is that that thing in front of you or that thing in your mouth is trying to tell you. I think the analogy that's probably the most useful is tasting food. I mean, when you taste something for the first time, even if you're a chef, you're not going tick, 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 how's the yes it, how's the sugar, you know, you're tasting the damn thing. Right? Six and grams you, of sodium you... chloride. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. And probably for you, I mean, when you're tasting, I mean, I don't know a barrel sample, you know, if it bit me, but, um, you know, or you're tasting juice or what have you, you're utterly paying attention to it, aren't you? Uh, and then you're depends. there's two there's different ways and there's different reasons <laughs> why I would be tasting wine if it's <laughs> in the winemaking process and we're evaluating barrels yeah um, uh, we're almost always doing that comparatively so we'll have <laughs> flights of flights of, of samples <laughs> and we're trying to identify the top samples so that we can aim them say at the esprit wines or right. ones that there might be an issue with so it's very it's pretty really pretty easy it's uh it's it's sort of a, a relative judgment like this one is remarkable <laughs> Okay, let me try a little deeper to figure out why it's remarkable. This one, there's a little less depth to it. 
Okay, great. So it's that. But it's, I mean, it's pretty, it, it's like an open book from the white. It is. Too, it absolutely. It? And I, I want to know yeah. as little as possible going into this. It's why we taste all of these blind. We don't know yeah. beyond that it's a particular variety. I right. don't want to know that this particular Roussan lot came from the bottom of the hill where it struggled to ripen. It was the last <laughs> pick and we fought right. with it during fermentation. <laughs> I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that right. the other one is from the the middle of the hill block that came in first and looked beautiful and went into the esprit the previous year. I don't want to know any of that. I don't want to right. know how much of it there is. I don't want to, don't want to know where it came from. I just want to evaluate it on its merits. Well, I am your sister in this respect is very much the last thing I want to know is how much it costs. There's <laughs> way too much nonsense floating around in my head, you know? So I truly block it and I block everything about it as much as possible. So it's so cool to talk about tasty <laughs> wine, isn't it? Um, so, I've talked to lots of master psalms who, who really quote you as an inspiration and a, uh, and a mentor. Uh, can you talk a little bit about mentorship and talk about sure. that, that kind of sharing the, sharing the, the journey and the, and the knowledge? I'm happy to. I mean, it was so clear to me from the get-go, you know, that um, this, is, this is not a competitive sport, you know. Uh, so everyone can pass or no one can pass. So it's really a brotherhood in the greater sense, brotherhood of man. And, you know, from the beginning, it was clear to me, if I can do it, you can do it. I really don't believe in talent much. I do believe in application and I believe in fierce determination, you know, though there are, let me tell you, some of my colleagues who are like frighteningly talented. <laughs> and I will back into this and in answering and tell you what I've been doing the last 10 weeks uh, now, none of the, the Court of Master Sommeliers is not doing anything live, right? But um, uh, the director of education, Melissa Manasov, thought up this fabulous thing where once a week we were uh, offering two MSs talking about um, a subject, um, be it, you know, tannin or least contact or, you know, how the hell do you blind taste Merlot? It's so confusing. And <laughs> I listened in on each and every one of them scribbling pages of notes, and I'll tell you why. We learn from each other. It never stops, you know. So as a mentor, I'm so sick of my own voice to be able to hear some of my colleagues about how they approach things, how they teach, what, they, what their priorities are in helping people through the process was just revelatory. Um, so, you know, that helps you understand, I think, that we are so diverse, we're so different, even though we've passed this exam, we mentor differently. And for me, you know, from the beginning, and it's never changed, I, uh, there's a saying that, what is that, uh, all things being equal, uh, the simplest solution is probably the best solution, you know, that's how I mentor. So when I sit down with someone, I, I, I truly, When people would come and stage with me, I would just throw them on the floor with me, working alongside, because you have to be able, can you hear me okay? Are we okay? Did you lose me? Uh-oh. I'm seeing uh, Jason look, uh, did we lose internet connection? Um, I'm worried that either my connection has gone bad or Madeline's connection has gone bad because I see her frozen. Um, okay, I am going to wait for her to come back on. It looks like it was maybe on her end since the plum, plum market has left. Um, let's invite plum market back on. Um, Okay, well, if it takes a, takes a couple minutes for uh, Madeline to get back reconnected. Um, I, Hi. Oh, <laughs> hello, sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that was on our end or on your end. Um, but there was a point where 
where you froze and then I got just a black screen mm -hmm. and then it said that Plum Market left. So oh, welcome no. back. <laughs> I don't know where the last thing you heard me, uh, you know, chattering about, but in any event, we were talking about mentoring. And, yeah, uh, talking about the, you're talking to... about the, the kind of, that everybody has their own, their own experiences and way of doing things to offer. Right. Um, and I feel and like mine is very is... much practical. You know, uh, working the floor, you can you can talk wine till you're blue, but until you can do it in a, a dining room that's going down with, you know, five other tables waiting for you and maximizing the 15 seconds you have with the lovely human in front of you, you know, that's floor service. You know, yeah. can you decan a bottle while you're doing that? Can you open a <laughs> bottle of champagne while you're doing that, you know? And... Um, Theory is just studying. You know, the, the, the punchline there, though, is you have to be able to retrieve the, um, the information under pressure because yep. our exam is live, unlike the MWs. And so a lot of mentoring is trying to help people through, you know, uh, exam anxiety. And, yep. uh, and then finally, blind tasting at the end of the day. I remember so clearly one of my British uh, colleagues uh, slash mentors who looked at me and said, why do we blind taste? We blind taste because it's the only way we have assessing the depth of your and breadth of your experience. And that made so much simple sense to me that that's how I approach it. And, you know, when I told you the wine never lies, honest to God, if it's, it's sitting there going, hi, can I, you know, I'm Riesling. And if you don't have recognition, if you just apply a little bit of detective common sense based on all the Rieslings you've tasted, you will figure me out. <laughs> and I think, because I think that's an important thing to, to make clear to people, because I think there's a lot of people who feel like blind tasting is kind of a parlor trick. Like mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a way of showing off esoteric knowledge instead of and it can be. a way it of can relating be. the experiences mm -hmm. that you have with mm -hmm. other wines to the wine that you have in front of you. No, and trusting your experience. I was listening to, I was listening to yesterday, uh, um, Jay Fletcher and Andy McNamara. And, you know, both of them really emphasize that, that you've got to trust all this experience you have, that even if you run into a wall, you know, you can sit there and think it out. You can figure it out. But, you know, again, the takeaway is you have to be able to manage your nerves to do that. That's why I'm a big fan of Navy SEALs. You know, they <laughs> learn how to function under pressure, right? Even better than restaurant workers. Yeah, seriously. Cool. So mm -hmm. uh, when we met, you were still in the restaurant world, but for the last yeah. decade or so, you have been in retail. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about what you do at Plum Market and sort of what the role is of, of retail in wine discovery for people. I'm happy to. I mean, uh, I was on premise, the wine director of a multiple restaurant group did, you know, wine and restaurants at all different levels from delis to white tablecloth. And you know, when I when I first went to retail, my my position, I'm still really a restaurant, uh, a restaurant person. I, I joke to Mark Jonah, who's one of the co-owners of Plum Market, that I'm his, you know, on premise cousin hanging out <laughs> with him. But, you know, um, one of the reasons I feel comfortable working for Plum, which is um, a privately owned upscale grocery store with a huge wine department uh, in Michigan and one one venue in Chicago. But uh, the the um, the mindset, the intent, the attitude towards the customer is very much like on premise, you know. So there's very much, you know, guest recognition, nobody resisting answering questions. You know, we go towards that. Um, it's, it was a little bit of a transition for me. It took me to, about two years to get used to the speed of retail. That was shocking to me, you know, because in restaurants, you're very contemplative about what you're going to put on by the glass, what makes it on the wine list, and it stays there for a while, <laughs> right? Whereas this whole concept of buying 20 cases and having it disappear <laughs> relatively quickly was very different indeed. But at the end of the day, um, also labels are very important. This was, you know, labels never mattered to me whatsoever, right? Until... I worked retail and then I realized how important they are because they catch your eye. Where is the placement? Is it in a stack? At what level is it on the shelf? You know, um, interacting with customers, guests, though, for us, at least at Plum, is very much like working the floor of a dining room. 
right. uh, really no different. Um, you know, and interestingly, in these times, there was like March, April, maybe going into May, people really kept their distance. Now, everyone's w wearing a mask. People are coming to the grocery store um, and hanging out because they're not going yeah. to restaurants for the most part. So they want to have conversations, you know, and people are very interested in food and wine harmony. All of a sudden, everybody's cooking, right? So what goes with that? Evan, I am promoting your book, Perfect Pairings, which was, you know, <laughs> your little gift, both to industry and consumers. Um, so, you know, um, I, I guess I made retail um, uh, a restaurant for me. And that hasn't betrayed me and no one seems so happy with me. But, the, the, you know, I went from largely what I do, by the way, and I have to I have to say I'm not the wine director. Mark Jonah is. But what I do is direct um, all of the events we do, which are not inconsiderable. And I help vet wines for the company. But I went from doing, you know, three to four um, uh, events a week live. Obviously, I wasn't at each one of them, but I would organize them in Michigan and Chicago to doing one a week virtual. I mean, overnight, you know, March 11th, we shut it all down. And within two weeks, we were doing virtual tastings. And Mark said to me, just try it, get on, don't worry. And I did. And people liked it. And we connected and I'm still doing it. So there's cool. yeah, intimacy talk, talk a little bit about those. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk, talk a little bit about the I guess the appeal and the challenges of the pivot to the live online events that we've all been doing. You know, um, first of all, we couldn't resist it. It was dictated to us, right? So I'm a big believer in, you know, making really good <laughs> lemonade. Um, what surprised me is um, how close the connection can be, almost yeah. more than live, because it's a level playing field especially if you're doing it what I call Brady Bunch style, you know, like a chat room. Right. You know, nobody's in the back of the room. You know, everybody's in the front of the room. Um, I was able to get, you know, a lot of people are willing to come on. I didn't have to wait for you to come to Detroit, right? Right. <laughs> to, to do it. And um, we had to figure out how to handle the wine. So our common sense at the very beginning said, I don't know, we offer three wines. We don't charge for them you know, for, for the tasting, people can purchase one or all three, uh, give a discount on the three pack and let's see what happens. And it yeah. worked, you know, uh, it truly, there was no template for it. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do it a little bit more, you know, organized if it's, you know, a, a big producer, a big subject, and I'm showing a lot of PowerPoint slides, we'll do it more webinar style. But our guests have told us they like they like Brady Bunch. <laughs> you know, they like yeah. being able to ask a question in real time when it's okay to unmute. And um, they love, you know, they want information, but they love pictures. It makes it come alive. I mean, I'm staring at you, right? Yeah. Um, giving that beautiful tour and looking at the grapes and seeing how, what was it? One of them, was it uh, Grenache? Or, it was Grenache where you had one, you know, green grape right on that. Uh, yeah that bunch i think one was yeah to see how they yeah, you know it, don't write them I, I, at the same time totally... so we make it educational and entertainment and, and i think you're totally uh, right we sell there those wines you know that's to the these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and i think you're absolutely right that there's an intimacy to these live online events that's difficult to replicate um even with an in-person event because I mean, it's you could be better. in my right. backyard. You could be in our mm -hmm. cellar, um, mm -hmm. and that's hard to that's hard to do. I can go to an event in Detroit, and I can tell people until I'm blue in the face about what the rocks look like here and what the grapes look like right before harvest. But you have opportunities when when you are vir taken virtually to a place like this to see and feel. Um, a place and a, an environment and, and the people that that's in some ways, I think more intimate than the, than the so old too. version of live events. I know I really do. And also, you know, I make, I put a lot of effort into what pictures we show, you know, I'm a map freak. All oh, some are. See, I'm, I'm so, you know, 
a history that I can't even say psalm. I like to say sommelier. It's a nice, it's a nice word. But, you know, let's look at a map. Where, where, where are we? You know, and then I like showing pictures of the family and, you know, cool vineyard shots. And I never dumb it down for consumers. I always assume they probably know more than I do. But I like to overstate the obvious in case we're using language that is not familiar to them. And I think yep. all of us in the wine business, you know it. We have to be very cognizant of that, you know. You can't say, just say mellow, you know, well, you know, you have to explain what mellow, <laughs> mellow yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, there's very okay. little, there's very little, which is more off-putting than jargon that people don't understand. Like, oh, you feel like God. you're already, you're already, like, have been kicked out of the, the cool kids club. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. I've, I've, I've read where in interviews you've talked about that, that you feel like that's, that's a really critical thing that that a sommelier needs to do is is kind of take the language to the level that the customer is at and not not make the words and descriptors of wine be a barrier they don't have to meet us halfway we have to meet them 100 percent of the way yeah. you know that's my job and actually um you know let's say pronunciation i used to tell people you know if somebody a guest mispronounced something maybe later when i floated by the table i might use the word in passing but i heard ron edwards speak yesterday and he said he doesn't even do that because they may go oh my god i said it wrong you know so just avoid the damn word unless uh you know <laughs> maybe we're being hypersensitive but how people feel and the trust factor with a guest or a consumer is everything don't you think so i totally agree totally agree mm -hmm. um okay on a on a more um more prosaic level what wines are you super excited about right now what are the things that oh, you oh, are well, you're gonna love for? this i've never been so going to the Barossa Valley, I learned not to say Barossa, I say Barossa, um, and tasting uh, Barossa Grenache, you know, you're intimate with Grenache, and I never really was. I mean, most of my exposure to it was in blends, so it was usually, you know, influenced by its brethren, uh, right? But to, to taste it uh, on its own was, uh, was a little bit of a revelation, so that's kind of neat. Uh, I pay closer attention to it now solo than I used to. And even in, you know, Southern, in the Southern Rhone, I mean, how many of those blends are Grenache dominated, you know, and then you have Reyes that's 100%. So another uh, category right. that I really love is, um, is the Duro, uh, because, you know, the whole uh, port grape phenomena that really in a very short period of time recreated itself or created this new category of dry reds from Turiga yeah. and Turiga and, you know, whatever else, this concentrated, floral, um, pretty smooth stuff that was just, uh, you know, shockingly good for the money. Your region, Paso, I was lucky enough to go. I've been there twice now. Once I met with you, you remember? We had lunch Absolutely. together. I ate a very good veggie sandwich. Thank <laughs> you. And then um, I went uh, back, and I didn't have time to come visit. I was just there for a couple of days, thanks to uh, Wine Speak, which yeah. was uh, sponsored by uh, what Ancient Peaks and, and yeah, Chuck it was such, a, such a great event. It was such a great event, and um, uh, you know that was really eye-opening. I had no idea to see the diversity of terroir geology, in in an American growing region was like, yay! It was yeah. really cool. Um, and what else? Oh, Austrian Riesling, which will never sell. It's too expensive. There's not much around it. But I got to tell you, you put your nose in that glass and the angels sing. <laughs> awesome. And I still love white burgundy. I like everything as long as it's good. I like Tembach wine. I like, you know, I don't, I'm not too spoiled. So I don't, it doesn't have to be highfalutin. I just recognize quality. And that's one of the things that I know I've always been really impressed with you every time I've gotten to see you speak or had the pleasure of, of, of sharing a meal with you is the, your, your enthusiasm is genuine and kind of boundless. Um, I mean, there are, there are wines, of all the, there are wines of all different sorts that, um, that you are really enthusiastic about. And I think that's one of the reasons why you've been able to, to be such an inspiration for so many people for so long is that, uh, 
is that you, you are maybe the least jaded Master Som that I've ever met. And <laughs> you've been doing it longer than most of them, which I think is just a, an absolutely wonderful thing. What a kind thing to say. You know, I only have existence to thank. I mean, the work keeps you humble, you know? I mean, how can you possibly be arrogant? There's always somebody smarter, faster, younger, whatever. Yay, I celebrate it all. And wine, you know, whether it's modest or highfalutin, uh, again, do you dock a person because what they're saying doesn't have complexity? I mean, maybe their simplicity is actually more poignant than something more complex, right? I mean, I'm sorry to make it, you know, anthropomorphize it, but we all, we all do it. I've just been very lucky. I've earned my living in, um, you know, wine came to me. I didn't look for it. And lucky me that I speak the language well enough and that I can still smell it and taste it. That's the other thing. As you're getting older, you're going, oh, boy, I hope this keeps working. <laughs> <laughs> so far, it's so good, right? Awesome. Cool. Um, so that's basically, we're at half an hour. Um, okay. I am super grateful that you, that you were able to and chose to spend this half hour with this little conversation and virtual visit here to Paso. Oh, may I add one little thing, please? Because it would be irresponsible for me if I didn't. Is that all right? Please. Um, if anybody wants to go online, plummarket.com. Uh, and if you want to join in, you don't even have to buy a thing, but it'd be great if you want to. Uh, if you're in the Midwest, Chicago or Michigan, we also ship to 19 states. But every Thursday or Friday, depending on whether it's, um, uh, you know, if I have a European on, I'll do it on Friday at 4, which is there like 10 or 11 p.m., right? But um, once a week, we do a virtual tasting, and that usually lasts about an hour, and they're fun and lighthearted. And if you like this style of me and Jason chatting, that's what it's all about. And we taste some pretty good wine, too. So just go to PlumMarket.com, virtual events. And thank you for letting me mention that. I almost forgot. You are very welcome. That was actually going to be the last thing. I was going to ask how people who wanted to learn more about what you were doing at Plum Market, how they should do it. So the Plum Market website, PlumMarket.com, is that the best, that's the best place? Yep. And if you, look at the, if you look at the banner at the top, virtual events. And, you know, even I can navigate it, you know, I mean, I've had, I have a team that put me on here with you. So <laughs> cool. I, I'm not resisting social media. I just think it's a slightly square peg round hole for me. But <laughs> here I am. I'm, I'm doing my best because I get to see your beautiful face. And I hope things are going well for you and your team and your family. Thank you. And, uh, and you're listening. Know, you, ever, you, ever, you ever want me to uh, come join you for one of, uh, one of your virtual events? Just ask. I'd love to. Deal. Okay, cool. So uh, thank you, Madeline. Thank you, everyone who joined this week. Um, and uh, I'll be on in two weeks with uh, Greg O'Byrne, the executive director of the Santa Fe Wine and Chili Fiesta. And we'll be talking about kind of the pivot from live events to virtual events on the festival side. Um, and again, I'm sure lots of other, lots of other conversations about uh, how to get into the world of wine and what to do once you're there. So again, thanks everybody. Um, thank you, Madeline, and uh, we'll see everybody in a couple of weeks. Take good care. Thank you. You too.